Verstappen wins the Austrian Grand Prix. And that, my friend, is two in two. Two in two. Absolute class of the field. Awesome. Yes, it's gone! Yes! Congratulations. <laughs> Great job, boys. We are definitely catching that. The only engine on the grid to power more than one team to victory in the turbo hybrid era. Since they've joined Red Bull proper in 2019, they've got victories at the hands of Max Verstappen in Germany, Austria, and Brazil. And in the 2020 season, they've added victories in Silverstone and then again at Monza through Gasly and Verstappen. Since applying power to the entire Red Bull portfolio, which includes Toro Rosso in 2018, Honda has powered Red Bull to 5 wins, 2 poles, and 20 podiums. And in 2020, Verstappen is the only driver on the grid to have a 100% podium rate of the races he's actually classified in. They've helped Red Bull cement themselves as the second best constructor on the grid. They've increased substantially production across both teams. And yet, Honda announces they are leaving the sport after the 2021 season. So, that begs the million dollar question. Why leave seemingly out of nowhere? As for their stated reasons, well, their press release speaks for itself. I'll link to that down in the description below. To summarize, the majority of their statement is centered around being carbon neutral by 2050. What's really interesting about this is Honda was adamant in their statement that racing is a part of their DNA. I've actually gone on their website and compiled a list of all of their motorsports they have exposure to currently. And while some of these series do have plans for more electrification, not all of them share the same voracious pursuit of carbon neutrality that Honda purportedly does. We want to aim carbon neutrality by 2050, so that's what we want to put our resources into, and I'm not thinking about reparticipating in Formula 1. Reparticipation. Remember that, that's going to be important. But that's the focus of today's video, so if you're not familiar with Honda's history in Formula 1, don't worry, we'll talk all about it today. The point is Honda's emphasis that this has nothing to do with recent economic pressures, but more so the natural trajectory of their long-term sustainability goals and in line with their objectives. But their continued supply of power across other global motorsports raises questions about whether some of this choice had to do with the bearish global economic outlook hitting most consumer industries, in particular automotives. So is the exit really out of nowhere? While it's undoubtedly true Honda are reallocating resources to meet their aggressive carbon neutral goals. It also wouldn't be the first time that they have made an exit from the sport due to unforeseen circumstances. As a global auto manufacturer, they have to be ready and willing to react to black swan events such as the one we find ourselves in right now. In fact, Honda have made an exit from the sport on three separate occasions prior to this one. Let's rewind and have a look at other times that Honda have made a beeline for the exit door. The 2008 Global Crisis The most recent of Honda's exits come in the 2008 season, one that will live in infamy as it gave way to the rise of the one-hit wonder Braun GP. I've actually told this story before at length, so I won't go too deep into the weeds here. But if you're ready to dive deep, go ahead and check the link in the description if you want to see that story. This exit came on the heels of the financial crisis, and it sprung up from a number of things, which include the deregulation of the financial industry, the spread of toxic assets, and policies around derivatives trading. The US housing bubble was long overdue to be deflated, but a perfect storm of events to cause a tremendous burst. And it wasn't just siloed to America. The global scale of the event was felt when the European debt crisis added to the mix. Down goes Lehman Brothers, Iceland fails, and Greece at the time were just on the verge of defaulting. Needless to say, now was not the time that a global auto manufacturer wanted to be spending exorbitant cash as margins were razor thin as is. But little did the world know Honda had major plans to put their car on top, and they were opening their checkbooks to do so. They had the car, the R&D, the concepts in place, all they needed now was a buyer. In comes Ross Brown as the principal stakeholder in the final hour taking the reins of his eponymous team. The Braun GP team shocked the grid, earning double championship honors, and now what is considered the most iconic, Cinderella-esque motorsport story in recent history. It wouldn't be the last time Honda reacted to stateside trouble and pulled out of the sport. The 1968 Honda R&D Triumph and Tragedy In 1968, Honda left the sport after just four short seasons, making a grand entrance as a supplier of power to their own works team. Their first iteration was the RA271. Honda was indeed in rare air, given that just two other constructors at the time were building not only their own engine, but their own chassis. Honda joined that short list with Ferrari and BRM, and despite all of the promise, a couple major catalysts have been cited for their exit. The first and most tragic was the death of Joe Schlesser. Honda developed the RA302 for the 1964 world champion John Surtees. He would refuse to drive the car due to its trouble handling and overall instability during a Silverstone test. He had expressed some fear about the magnesium skin monocoque that was highly flammable. But Honda R&D pursued the innovative package accordingly to control for weight fluctuations. Having turned up to the French Grand Prix and the iteration Surtees thought to be too dangerous, he outright refused to drive the car under any circumstance. 
and it would be Joe Schlesser that would answer the call. The perfect race for the French driver at his home Grand Prix, finally in a big budget car that hadn't yet been proven. It had all the undertones of what could be an underdog success story, but unfortunately, it would turn out to be Schlesser's last drive as the RA302 had done everything Surtees feared it would, which was A, uncontrollable, and B, highly flammable. Just a handful of laps into the race and the car flipped, catching fire almost immediately. The blaze was so intense, there was nothing anyone could do even in the most ideal of rescue circumstances. Tragically, Schlesser was killed instantly, and in stunningly poor taste, Honda thought it wise to recreate the magnesium monster with some alterations. But to no surprise, Surtees was not convinced by the previous showing and would not touch the car. After some much needed contemplation and consideration, the team decided not to turn up to race on the grid the next season. But the black page they had penned that 1968 season, adding a fourth driver the paddock lost in the line of duty, was only part of the reason that drove them off the grid. For Honda to continue their expansion, they knew they would have to make inroads in the US market where road car sales were a tremendous potential size of prize. It actually wasn't all that long before their Formula 1 debut did they successfully mass produce their first road car, which is absolutely unheard of by today's standards. <laughs> Interestingly, it wasn't until their third exit in 2008 from the sport that Honda would for the first time breach double digits in the US market share. And while they continued to grow their operations and foothold on the global auto scene, their interest for the top single-seater series returned, and with it, Honda's success. But this time, of the much different sort. Let's look at Honda's second soiree into Formula 1, where it would be their engine program that would steal the show. It's been 15 years since Honda had a play in F1, but the 1983 season was met with their re-emergence. The decision to focus on supplying engines to teams was a fruitful one to all parties. The Honda V6 Turbo was dominant, powering a dynasty with two separate teams. Williams ran on Honda Power from 1983 to 1987. They sputtered at first, having been trusted by Frank Williams to run his race cars thanks to their proof of concept with Spirit the season before, but would soon be comfortable, and by the latter half of 1985, it was obvious that Williams were the team to beat. Over the five seasons running on Honda Power, they'd secured three titles, 23 wins, 19 poles, and 47 podiums. The partnership came to an end due to a dispute about placing Nakajima in the seat. Honda, PK, and Nakajima would take their talents to Lotus, where a seat just opened up thanks to Ayrton Senna making a move for McLaren. And speaking of, McLaren had been enjoying a solid run of their own thanks to the powerful tag badge Porsche 1.5 V6 Turbo. The 1988 season was the start of one of the most dominant core packages the grid has ever seen with the almighty MP44, Alain Prost, Ayrton Senna, the technical pair of Nichols and Murray, and of course, the Honda RA168E V6 Turbo. The team of Senna and Prost was so electric, all they needed was two seasons together for each of them to get a world title. Prost would move to Ferrari, while McLaren powered Senna to two additional world championships consecutively in 1990 and 1991. The end of the Turbo era was the start of the exit for Honda, but they stuck around for a few more seasons given that the McLaren chassis was solid and Senna was in his prime. He could pretty much take anything half decent around for a competitive lap. Of the 80 races they ran together over 5 years, they took 44 of 80 victories for a 55% win rate. That unprecedented 1988 season was especially brutal for the competition, as the Honda-powered MP4 would win all but one Grand Prix. They'd combined for 8 titles, 53 poles, and 91 podiums in total. On the eve of that legendary season in 1988, economic headwinds were brewing as the Japanese asset price bubble began to take form as early as 1987. Monetary policy in Japan became of critical importance. As the US was going through a catastrophic failure of their own in the form of Black Monday in 1987, pressure spread in the global economy, and this triggered a delay in credit tightening in Japan. With the financial markets in Japan in ruins by the end of 1982, a full decade of economic stagnation was on the horizon, and this is often referred to as the lost decade. To cope with the situation, Honda was unable to continue their engine program directly, understandably, and thus pulled out of the sport following Mansell's usurping of Senna as world champion for Frank Williams. But Honda still wasn't done quite just yet. There was a return in the year 2000. They acted in tandem with the independently operated, yet highly collaborative team of Mugen Motorsports from 1993 until the 1998 season, winning four Grand Prix in total. But Honda would officially return again as a racing team in 2000 to power BAR and Jordan, and ultimately dropped the latter after the 2002 season. Just ahead of the 2005 season, Honda bought 45% of the team from the parent company. Seeing the writing on the wall with regards to the restrictive laws around tobacco advertising, Honda would go on to buy the remaining 55% from the parent company ahead of the prohibition of tobacco money and ad space in the late 2005. 
Lucky Strike would make its final appearance on the now Honda team's race car for the 2006 season. Thus began Honda's campaign as a full-on team for the first time in nearly 40 years, since the tragedy involving Joe Schechtler in 1968. Which brings us back neatly to where we began, with the 2008 season being the final in this stint for the team thanks to a late buyout of Ross Braun and Nick Fry in the 2009 season. Honda's next inactive period would be about the same we saw in the 90s before they'd make their way back to the grid yet again in hopes to resurrect their dominant form from the late 80s with McLaren. But this time around, the partnership wasn't nearly as glorious. The Honda Alonzo fiefdom that was brewing became a major distraction, but was more of a product of the failed vision of the once powerful partnership between Honda and McLaren. Both pointed the finger at one another, but ultimately the sport lost out as McLaren dissolved their relationship in the late 2017. The silver lining was, McLaren and Honda learned a valuable lesson on the importance of synergies within the car and had a clear vision on the type of partnership they were after. In what would turn out to be Honda's last stint in F1, for now, both of the McLaren and Honda stories have happy endings, relatively speaking. As of right now, McLaren sits comfortably in third place in the Constructors' Championship, while Honda has propelled Red Bull's package considerably forward in the last couple of years. So that's all the context and backstory for Honda. So what now for Red Bull? As you can hopefully see now, Honda's exit really isn't that big of a shock. And now it should make a little bit more sense why I hinted at this back in January in my Formula 1 Fridays video. When you secure one of the most promising drivers on the grid long term, yet are unwilling to make a firm statement about your involvement beyond 2021, for me, that was a clear sign of what was to come. Even with Honda on the hook for the 2021 power unit, the fact remains that Red Bull needs an engine supplier and fast. They have proven that their involvement in F1 is unwavering as they've inked their name to the Concord Agreement that is set to last until 2025. While Red Bull surely aren't over the moon about the situation, they do seem eager to handle this issue without delay and also support the decision from Honda. This was echoed in Christian Horner's comments from Friday as you can see on screen now. To understand what's next, I've laid out four scenarios on what their options are for power supply for 2022 and beyond. Scenario 1, and most likely, Renault. As much as we may all look forward to the drama of Renault having veto power, they technically won't. Appendix 4 of the FIA regulations under Article B protects against a team not securing power. I've left the regulations in their exact verbiage up on screen right now, but I'll also leave a link in the description for you to download your copy of the regulations for yourself. And the sentiment was pretty much confirmed. Cyril was quoted as saying, I guess it is only at this point in time that it will be discussed if Red Bull failed to find a solution, which I really hope will not be the situation. Their rather public fallout was captured by the media. I don't think there's much love lost between the two. Should Renault get the task of supplying Red Bull, it'll mark a switch from works partnership to customer partnership. And if I were a wagering person, I would put my money in Scenario 1. But here are the other three, just in case. Scenario 2, and most interesting, but not likely, Mercedes. Scenario 3, and least likely, Ferrari. And Scenario 4, and near impossible, secure power from an outside source, third party, or on their own. In nearly all of these scenarios, F1 will only have three engine suppliers, a feat that has only happened a handful of times, most notably in 1973, 1974, and 1980 seasons. And in these three instances, there were significantly more teams fielded at each race. Teams had significantly more room to differentiate their cars, and reliability was the major wild card. Another notable yet modern example of just three power unit suppliers was in 2014, which was at the start of the new turbo hybrid era. So while it's rare, it's not unthinkable. And while Honda's involvement in F1 has come and gone, each instance is predicated on some sort of global landscape shift, usually economic. So while I maintain this likely has some financial implications tied to it given the current conditions globally, it also signals a changing of the sport is on the horizon. And as per usual, I'll give you the history of the facts and information first, and then my own personal thoughts. And my take on this is that the true problem of this partly rests with the brand identity crisis Formula 1 found themselves in with the introduction of the turbo hybrid era. The implication isn't that turbo hybrid technology is bad. It's simply a comment on the fact that Formula 1 is the pinnacle of racing, quote unquote. How many times have you heard that? But Formula 1 has not made up its mind about what it wants to be, or better said, it's constantly at odds with the sport it wants to be, but still having to make concessions to fund that dream. These concessions include capitulating to the needs of a manufacturer that is funded by the road cars. Ultimately, when you run a sport that way, you have to always be thinking about what's best for the good of the global consumer. Win Sunday, sell Monday gets a whole lot less effective if people are buying more and more green. With each engine restriction and each move that attempts to distance us from the ICE, we inch closer and closer to other racing categories that can rightly begin to argue their contention for the pinnacle of racing. Let's get real, aero rules aren't looking like they're going to expand. 
The only major disruption you can add to the sport if we continue down the path we're on is to ease fuel flow restrictions as well as open back up the use of exotic or advanced hybrid fuels. This could serve as an eloquent solution that is relatively in line with green initiatives while maximizing the output of power unit systems that would yield increased speed, power, and more importantly, major innovation. And this could give teams the runway to find space up the grid. So Liberty, FOM, if you're watching, next-gen fuels please. Just one cranky Yankees hot take. So is the exit of Honda a potential destroyer of Formula 1? Honda's now fourth exit is the tangible manifestation of a sport at its knees, stuck in no man's land. A sport not sure if they want to be the cost-effective, loud, simple single-seater giving the best races possible globally, or the genuine pinnacle of motor racing. So no, Honda didn't kill F1, they are not the executioners, in my opinion. I'd amend that narrative, designating Honda more so the corners. They've come to validate the fear of many F1 fans about the slow decay of a sport struggling to adapt. But whatever your thoughts, we have to deal with the reality of the situation. Honda, by the end of next season, will be gone. And it doesn't look like they're returning. But the question I have for you, and let me know down in the comment section below, will Max Verstappen go too? Or will he stick around beyond 2021 and into the new regs? But whatever happens, you can get all of the breaking news for Formula 1 here, along with the history and all the nuance with it. Thanks for checking this out, and I'll see you very, very soon.